with uh, uh, all of the modern technologies that uh, we have right now, it's possible for almost any engineer who has enough experience to join a um, space exploration company or to start uh, your own because. Welcome everyone to the Voice of Innovation Fireside Chat. These conversations explore the work of innovators and the future of pervasive AI. I'm really excited about today's guests. First, of course, my co-host Kurt Busch, the CEO of Sentient. He brings his expertise in semiconductors and AI into this conversation. And we're speaking today with Rod Memim, who is the COO of Spacebit. And that's one of those new space companies that you might have not heard of yet, but are doing incredible things and are really pushing the boundaries of what's possible. So let's dive in. Where did you guys come up with the idea of sending small robots to the moon? It took us some time to uh, came to this idea. Uh, we had uh, several internal startups and uh, all of us, I mean, in, the, in our team, all of us are really uh, believe in lunar economies. economies. So uh, we tried to find uh, what would be the most beneficial to do right now. And uh, after some assessment, we realized uh, that uh, um, at the time, in a couple of years, uh, several companies would fly to the moon. So uh, we realized that to be able to um, uh, explore the lunar surface in an efficient and robust manner, we would have to design uh, some kind of uh, smaller robots. Uh, right now, most of the robots are quite heavy and they're super expensive. And uh, it seems like um, a lot of things in the world tries to be uh, much more miniature. Like uh, we believe that the same uh, things that happened with the uh, computers, with the smartphones, would happen with the robotics. And in terms of, I mean, um, 50 years ago, uh, computers that uh, have sent people to the moon uh, were, the, were the size of uh, of a huge football field. And nowadays, uh, smartphones uh, they have enough uh, power to do the same computations. And after a lot of assessment, after trying to understand what is needed, we came to the idea. So it's just, uh, it's really hard to, to explain, but uh, once you start working uh, in this area, you realize that um, you just make several iterations, uh, you're thinking what uh, could be needed, and after a while, you're coming to the idea. And in our case, we came to that idea. Okay, very nice. Very nice. Uh -huh. And. Maybe you can tell me kind of what, what are the the big problems that you've had in, in building small robots? What are kind of the, the constraints and the things that you're trying to overcome? There are a lot of challenges and uh, a lot of challenges are the same as we have on the earth, but uh, a lot of new challenges appear. One of the most important uh, limitations that we have is that, that we have to um, we have invested a lot of uh, efforts into thermal stabilization system because robots are small and we have uh, not so many available power and during the flight there is a huge chance that our robots could freeze because uh, they would uh, point towards the outer space and the uh, ambient temperature of the outer space is around 2.4 Kelvin. It's really cold there, uh, and uh, on the moon uh, our robots would face another issue. It's quite hot on the surface of the moon during the lunar day. The temperature could raise up to 120 degrees Celsius, and it's really hard to balance. We have uh, our robots have to sustain really cold conditions and really hot conditions. Another issue is that, uh, as I said before. We have a lot of issues with uh, power. Uh, we have to choose a lot of uh, really energy efficient components. And moreover, we are not able to make fully autonomous robots because we are not able to put uh, good processors there that have enough computation power. So um, our robots and all of uh, our components, uh, they're quite um, fancy in terms of uh, they're really low powerful, but at the same time uh, have enough computation power for that. And of course, because our robot, uh, well, our robot Asaguma uses uh, legs instead of wheels, it means that uh, we had to invest a lot of um, 
efforts in designing uh, mechanics that would sustain uh, lunar dust that would work in, uh, as I said before, uh, high temperature. And uh, yeah, so everything is hard and uh, uh, in terms of uh, lunar conditions, everything is hard 10 times because we have a lot of limitations in terms of math, in terms of available power and things like that. Oh, that's quite interesting. I mean, when we when we started Sentient, we we had this idea of moving machine learning from something that's in the cloud to to in the small device, and and eventually we got to the point of adding the most amount of neural compute into battery operated devices. So so we often fight with these kinds of these these kinds of issues as well around size and thermal and power. Um, though we are not operating in in any two degree Kelvin situations, as far as I'm aware of, but. The idea of putting as much as much compute into as as small a possible footprint is 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 probably in line with with much of the things that you're trying to do with your robots. Well, Rob mentioned uh, like sending a fully autonomous rover to the moon would would uh, would be risky. I'm curious why. So why did you, yeah the decision for semi-autonomous? Yeah, there are two main reasons uh, why we. Um, had to design a semi-autonomous, not fully autonomous robot. The first reason, and I would say that it's the main reason, is that um, our mission is quite critical and we want to have uh, full control over the robot. So we are really worried that fully autonomous robots could do something wrong because uh, Terrain conditions on the moon, they're quite different from the ones that we have on Earth and uh, something can go wrong. So it's just uh, the way, frankly speaking, most of uh, space missions, they are designed in a way when uh, they're quite semi-autonomous. Um, and uh, so the first reason is that um, uh, the mission is quite complicated and it's really important. So we want to have almost uh, complete control over the robot's uh, motion. On the other hand, we have limitations uh, like um, um, time uh, that is needed for the signal to uh, travel to the robot. It will take uh, up to, it will take from two seconds for the signal to get to the robot one way, uh, only in one way. So uh, for sure we are not able to, uh, to control the robot in real time. And from that perspective, the robot has to do certain things by its own, like we are uploading uh, the program into the robot and then it performs the program. But during uh, that period of time, something can go wrong. And the robot has to be able to make uh, certain decisions on its own. Like, for example, uh, if uh, uh, the robot has lost uh, signal, then uh, it has to find uh, the way back uh, where he had the signal before. And uh, the second reason uh, why we had to design semi-autonomous is that, frankly speaking, we do not have enough uh, uh, computation power. We do not have uh, good enough processors uh, because they require too much power and they require too much weight. Uh, we are not able to use, uh, for example, something like um, NVIDIA Jetson because it requires too much power. As our robot is really small and it has a, a one small uh, solar panel, uh, we have to be really energy efficient. And I believe there is a third reason for now, is that um, we are just not interested in fully autonomous robots yet, because we do not have enough uh, data and um, we have to control the robot by ourselves. Uh, I mean, our mission is designed in a way when we are adept to uh, um, to the conditions that we would uh, see. I mean, right now we cannot say in advance uh, what uh, interesting things we would find on the moon. Uh, on the other hand, we, we are not for sure that we, we would find really interesting rocks and we would have to go to these rocks. And uh, our robot has some capabilities that allows them to, uh, to find the way to these rocks. But uh, after all, uh, uh, we are, uh, as humans, have to say to robot what it has to do. And uh, combining uh, all of uh, that, uh, limited resources, uh, lack of 
uh, understanding of lunar environment. We are uh, interested that a uh, lot of information w- would be gathered during the mission. We decided to make it semi-autonomous. And when you when you launch your your robots to, to the moon, how how many robots are in the swarm? Is this dozens? Is it is it hundreds? What what is what is kind of the scale of of, of the swarm and then then the uh... We really believe in uh, small technologies, and we really believe that the swarm of uh, small robots uh, would be really efficient in exploring lunar surface. On the other hand, um, uh, in the in our first uh, two or three missions, we would like to send just one or two robots because we want to check, we want to test how they work. Uh, we have to gather a lot of data about uh, performance of our robots in lunar conditions. And uh, step by step, uh, with uh, uh, as a lot of missions uh, are happening to the moon, uh, in the next years at least, we hope that it would happen according to NASA's CLPS uh, program. We would send more and more robots, but uh, we have to start uh, with uh, something small, we have to test, we have to gather data, and then uh, step by step, we would send more and more robots. Could you give us a, an idea about the advantages of the robot being actually on the on the surface of the moon versus versus just flying very low over the moon. What what kind of things that you have if you're on the surface that you can't get from just flying over? Yeah. The thing is that it's really hard to make a robot that would fly for for a long period of time on the lunar surface. There is no there is almost no atmosphere on the moon so uh, the only way to make uh, the robots fly is to use uh, rocket propulsion and uh, it means that they require a lot of uh, uh, fuel uh, and uh, uh, fuel means uh, a lot of fuel means that uh, they have to wait a lot and uh, wait uh, means uh, that you have to pay a lot for the missions so after all it's just almost not possible to use um, flying robots uh, on a uh, lunar surface. The limitation is that right now, unfortunately, we do not have anti-gravity engines that allows uh, robots to fly without atmosphere for a long period of time. So just just sending rockets over the moon doesn't give you enough enough. Uh, I, I guess enough res- rev- resolution to to really explore the surface of the moon. Uh, yeah, for sure. So there are several reasons uh, why we have to explore. Well, actually, we have to explore both from uh, uh, from lunar orbit and uh, from surface. So both uh, satellites and robots has to work together. The thing is that uh, uh, from uh, from um, uh, orbit, uh, you do not have not only enough resolution, but uh, you cannot. Uh, uh, take a picture of from uh, from its side so uh, the only image that you can see is uh, from the top but uh, you cannot uh, take a photo you cannot even enter lunar cave you cannot uh, come close to to the interested rock and uh, moreover it, it, some instruments uh, they ha- has to be placed directly to the uh, area of interest so yeah, let, let's explore that a little bit so so with with legs and rechargeable batteries, how long will your your robots last, and, and how much how much area are they going to be able to cover? Yeah. So uh, the goal for uh, uh, first of the missions is to travel for ten meters. Um, the robot would be able to survive uh, on lunar surface only uh, during lunar night. Sorry, only during lunar day, and uh, lunar day uh, on the moon lasts for fourteen. Uh, Earth days. So uh, uh, our uh, active phase would be around 10 days, 10 Earth days on the surface of the Moon. And during these 10 days, our robot uh, would be the goal for uh, those 10 days is to travel for uh, 10 meters. But we hope that uh, they would be able to travel for for, for longer distance. And unfortunately, when uh, a night comes, most probably our robot would die uh, because. Uh, uh, in the first two missions, because they do not have enough uh, thermal insulation, they do not have enough uh, um, uh, battery capacity to survive lunar night. Because during the lunar night, 
uh, temperature could uh, drop up to minus 70 degrees sorry minus 170 degrees celsius and um, so our robot would be active only for one uh, lunar day and after that they would die so, so good your chips haven't been in the space yet they have not you know the, the margin is is actually quite good for spacecraft but, but the volumes is really not very high yeah and uh, we, we are we are trying to ship millions and millions of units, so uh, so no, not you know that definitely not there for spacecraft yet. Yeah. So um, um, software and uh, and machine learning plays a big part. If I'm correct, you're you're using a, a number of uh, or at least part of a number of like uh, open source uh, software platforms. Um, is, is that also something that has sort of like made what you are doing now achievable by a small distributed team? Well, it's a really a huge uh, question. And one of the main reasons why we prefer to stick to open source software is uh, the simple fact is that uh, at any given point in time, you can modify it. So if something is not work, you can uh, change it. Um, on the other hand, we are relying on a set of uh, technologies, uh, like, for example, we are using uh, Linux uh, as um, an operation system. And um, it's really convenient because there are a lot of uh, information about how Linux works and uh, things like that. Um, but uh, in our uh, mission, uh, we are using, well, uh, to make mission like our successful, uh, we have to use uh, several uh, components that work together. We have to have some kind of uh, uh, database database uh, that is able to store, to pass uh, comments to our robots, uh, to store uh, logs of all uh, uh, sent comments, and to store uh, telemetry. Uh, and we have to have some kind of core software that uh, runs our that yeah. runs the robot. Um, frankly speaking, we have started to develop a lot of uh, components of such a system by ourselves, but after a while we realized, and I have to say that it's not so hard to develop such a things. The issue is that uh, after you have developed uh, these components, you have to support them. And at this point in time, it could become uh, quite complicated. I'd say that um, not only open source uh, technologies uh, allows missions uh, such as appearance, but uh, a lot of modern technologies and the availability of uh, knowledge really helps. So uh, right now you can find a lot of information in the internet, not only about software, but about lunar conditions and um, things like that. So open source software really helps us yeah. and am i correct that you uh in the also have been planning to use uh blockchain technology for like the data applications or maybe for mission de uh, deployment yes yeah, so uh we have some experience with uh, blockchain and in our case uh, we are thinking yeah. we are planning to use blockchain to distribute data that we would receive uh, among our partners on Earth. Um, we have some, uh, we made some research in terms of uh, possibility to use blockchain to pass uh, data uh, to our robots, but unfortunately it requires too much uh, computation power. So for the first missions, uh, we are planning to use blockchain only to distribute uh, data on uh, Earth, on the ground segment or on Earth. And it's really convenient. It allows to easily send data to a lot of partners and to control how the data is being used. Could you tell us a little bit about you know how difficult it is it to get a ride to the moon? How do you secure the space? How, how do you schedule this? You know, how is how is this whole process? If I want to send something to the moon, it costs around 1.2 million US dollars to send something to the moon. But uh, once you pay uh, those money, of course, you have to design uh, the system, the cyber physical system that is able to survive a uh, uh, flight and uh, that is able to operate on the uh, lunar surface. 
Um, and it's not so hard as well because so right now, nowadays there are a lot of already existing technologies um, and um, in our case we decided to build to base our robots uh, on the technology on the approach that is called the CubeSat. Uh, CubeSats are small uh, satellites uh, that has a weight of no more than 1.3 kilos and um, as there are a lot of already existing components we can reduce the VC components rather than uh, rather than uh, designing our own components, uh, which makes the emissions much uh, cheaper. So, so the short answer is, it's not so hard to send uh, something to the moon nowadays, but it's quite expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And and Rod, is it um, primarily the fact that uh, costs have to go down, like for example, costs of the payload, or are there also certain technical barriers that still need to be overcome to make that possible? For sure the prices has to go down because it's quite expensive when you have to pay 1.2 million for one kilo. From um, from technical perspective, um, I believe we live in a really amazing time when a lot of uh, technologies that is needed for missions like ours, they are already existing and you just have to combine all the existing technology into uh, one thing that works. So, yeah, I believe the main drive for for uh, for future space exploration is to um, lower uh, the costs and uh, yeah, technology, they already exist and uh, you can just uh, buy a lot of existing uh, things on the market that even has life heritage and you can put them in your robot and uh, send it to space but you know i just realized that from a certain perspective um, technology drives uh, in most cases uh, 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 advanced technologies means that they have a lower price than uh, previously existing technologies so from a certain perspective uh, lowering the price uh, for space exploration, meaning that you have to have uh, much more advanced technologies uh, that uh, that allows you to do that. So maybe from that perspective, uh, we still have to uh, create a lot of new technologies. Yeah, yeah. And because I um, uh, I've I've seen you, your rover is based on the CubeSat, uh, and the CubeSat, of course, being like uh, originally developed as being a very tiny, cheap satellite. Um, and that has, of course, made a lot of these new space exploration uh, or mostly Earth observation actually in a way possible. But you're taking a CubeSat and then putting it on the moon and actually putting, uh, putting it in a rover, um, which they were not designed for originally, right? Can, can you elaborate on that? Like, how did you take a CubeSat and turn it into a rover? The short answer is that uh, basically we have attached uh, legs to the CubeSat. The, lot, the long answer is that we had made uh, several iterations of uh, the design. Initially, we started with the uh, plain CubeSat components, but after a long while, we realized that uh, it's not uh, uh, so efficient. So after initial, well, basically we just made several iterations. Uh, we started with a simple CubeSat design with attaching legs to, to CubeSat, but after a while we had to redesign some parts of uh, the CubeSat and that's it. Right now, uh, after a couple of iterations, we uh, stuck with the design that we have right now that is based from a certain perspective on one half of uh, the CubeSat. Nice, yeah. That, I mean, that that is actually, I think, a pretty interesting message to, to, to all the engineers around, like, because uh, space technology sounds something that maybe only you know only the one percent of the world does uh, but we've reached a point uh, technology wise and, and, and uh, uh, also commercially that uh, anyone with an engineering degree could uh, could start going into space as a, as a field we really believe we really believe that um, humanity has to go to space because um, Space has unlimited resources, and um, um, having access to space resources would allow us to live sustainably on Earth. Moreover, if uh, something bad happens, then um, 
uh, if uh, we would have a chance to sleep on another planet, we would have some kind of a, a plan B. And with uh, uh, all of the modern technologies that uh, we have right now, it's possible for almost any engineer who has enough experience to join um, a space exploration company or to start uh, your own, because right now a lot of already technologies, they already exist and uh, you can just take these technologies, combine them together and make something valuable, something tangible. Ten years ago, it was not possible to, the only way for you to send something to to the moon was to start your own uh, uh, rocket company and nowadays with all of uh, the available technology to us we can uh, make a lot just working from home just having access to internet to computers and being able to design something and then build it uh, remotely and uh, distributedly so yeah i often think about you know this question is is the time now for any type of, of technology and and i i developed my my first first neural network in in i think it was 1990 and it's taken you know quite quite a lot of time before i'm working at a company that that is commercially doing neural networks and and as you said it's it's the infrastructure is that what do we have today it was the the, the three main pieces of infrastructure is we have we have processors that can run them and today it's primarily in the cloud, but at Sentient we're building processors to run them in small battery powered devices. The second is the frameworks, things like TensorFlow and PyTorch and, and things like Keras to make it easier to run on top of TensorFlow and so on. Um, but it's also the data. And as time goes by, there's more and more data that allows us to, to make these neural networks more and more useful. And you know, today, most of the data we have is, is terrestrial data. But with companies like yourselves that are going to the moon, you're going to be collecting a lot of data that, that, is, that is extraterrestrial data. Is, is we're gonna collect data from, from, different, from a different planet and, and start, and that data is going to be adding to the sum of knowledge. And it's, it's going to be, it's gonna open up things that we just can't imagine today. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, from my personal experience and the most, I believe the most important thing that I've learned uh, for in the last few years is that you just have to do you just have to work on the problem you have to do a lot of iterations but after all um, after all of the assessment assessment of a lot of designs it turns out that a lot of things that they are quite not obvious but they're quite straightforward and a lot of things that they just needs to be done and that's all of course you need to have uh, appropriate experience you need to have appropriate type of thinking but most of engineers they are good enough to work in a space exploration company that's a great moment to wrap up Kurt, Rod, thank you so much this is fascinating and for everyone who's watching or listening if you want to stay up to date about future episodes follow Revolver or Sintient on any of your favorite channels also we're looking forward to hear any feedback thoughts and ideas for future episodes Thank you so much.